All right, so um, I'd like to just give some alternate perspective on one of the Griffith uh, problems. I think this, I, I think, I hope that it will, will shed a little bit of light on just the, um, the general problem solving strategy. And um, this is uh, related to uh, Griffith's uh, problem number 3.21. Um, in my course, I just, you know, um, made up a problem and kind of changed the wording just a little bit. But basically, um, it's related to example 3.8. I should just say that I'm using the fourth edition in case somebody else is watching this and wants to follow along. This is the Griffiths uh, Electrodynamics, or otherwise UNM. And um, example uh, 3.8, you have an uncharged sphere that's placed into a uniform um, field. And so maybe outside the sphere, this uniform field looks like this, but then this, this sphere is maybe distorting the field, something like this, right? So, so the basic question, like, you know, in the, uh, I'm going to draw it a little bit distorted here, something like this, and then maybe less distorted out here. Um, so this is, this is what happens uh, when you put an uncharged sphere. Um, the plus charges will go here, the minus charges will go here. This is worked out in some detail in, um, in Griffith's example 3.8. And um, just to summarize, the, the, uh, the electropotential inside, so for R is less than capital R, um, he set it equal to zero. And that for V is greater than R, this ended up being equal to minus E naught R close theta um, plus uh, E naught R cubed over R squared cosine theta. And basically we can interpret this here. I'll just write the two terms minus E naught Z and then plus E naught R cubed over R squared cos theta. Um, that this essentially was the sort of external field. Um, this was related to the external uh, electric field and that this was sort of the like induced part, okay? And so now the question becomes, so this is, this, this is I'm just like reviewing things that have already been said, um, which is that the, um, the presence of this metal sphere in an electric field creates this sort of induced field outside. So, okay, so, so far so good. I haven't really said anything new, um, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to sort of, uh, I don't know, I guess contribute my own sort of way of thinking about this problem. Maybe it's not so unique, but anyway, I just just uh, share my ideas here that um, Griffiths says, uh, okay, well then suppose that you put some plus Q um, on this sphere and then same problem. You put, in, so instead of it being uncharged, you actually put some plus Q. Now what's the potential? And the way that he says it is like, okay, well, let's just imagine then in this whole plane here um, that we're going to set that equals to V equals to zero, far, far away from the sphere. And then like, he just like says that and then bam, it ends up being exactly the solution here. So V is equal to this minus E naught, I'll just do R cosine of theta plus this e naught r cubed over r squared cosine theta, and then he just writes plus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught uh, q over r. And it's just like, bam, just like that. That's the solution. But actually, I have to admit that I didn't really understand this, uh, and I wanted to just work it out completely. Um, spoiler alert, I ended up with the same solution, but I just don't, actually, I don't understand um, this, log this line of logic. Um, it, to me, that doesn't completely make sense. Um, like I just, it, I guess it leaves too much room for for um, uncertainty that I don't don't completely understand. Um, um, I mean, it, I guess it makes sense because if you set the theta equals to pi over two, theta is equal to pi over two, then this should be true, right? So it's like it's like really clever way of solving the problem. So like. <laughs> Maybe what I'm contributing is my less clever way of solving the problem. So um, let's just start from scratch here. We've got this um, 
this metal uh, uh, sphere of radius r, and we're going to put some positive q charge on this thing. So the way I looked at it is that whether or not there's an electric field, right? So we can we can say okay, there is going to be sort of this like electric field that's going like this, but actually, um, to me it seems that that uh, I should be able to integrate from infinity to the surface of this. Um, sphere here. And of course, since it's a metal sphere, that means it's an equipotential. And that means that the electric field inside is zero or that the potential is the same um, everywhere inside of the sphere. So if I wanted to, I could say, well, then the potential at R is equal to capital R is going to be equal to minus integral from infinity, going from infinity to capital R of one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R squared uh, dr, right? And this is kind of like just me thinking about it without the electric field there for a moment, right? If you do this integral, you'll get kq over capital R. Okay, so at this point, I'm like, well, let's think about this. If I put an external electric field, should that change the potential of the sphere? And my answer is sort of like, I don't think so. I don't think that that's going to change the um, I don't think that's going to change the potential of this sphere, and certainly not in this um, uh, what what Griffiths calls is this equatorial plane. So I'm going to try to set up some boundary conditions then to solve the problem, just like we've solved for other situations. So the v at r is equal to capital R then should be equal to instead of zero, which is what he did in example 3.8, it should be kq over capital R. So we'll call this boundary condition number one. Boundary condition number two is going to be when r goes to infinity. And that's going to be equal to this minus e naught z, like he had in, you know, in the, in the uh, example. But there should also be this uh, plus uh, kq over lowercase r. That that should also be a part of the solution, right? So now, if we can if ever possible, I like to write these in terms of the um, Legendre polynomials. So let's just write this as minus e naught r cosine of theta plus kq over r. And if I remember the, the p0 of cosine theta, or p0 of cosine theta is just equal to 1. And p1 of cosine theta, that's going to be equal to cosine of theta. So really we're just dealing with the first two terms here, p, p0 and p1. And I can actually rewrite these as minus e naught r times p1 of cosine theta plus kq over r times p0 of cosine theta. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a minute. So I just wanted to rewrite this in a way. And actually, you know, while we're at it, um, why don't we actually rewrite this as times p0 of cosine of theta, right? And then that way it'll become completely clear how we're solving these um, boundary conditions. So Let's actually solve first, let's apply boundary condition number one. Um, and actually, let, let's, let's, okay, let's, let's write the uh, general form of the solution here is this, is going to be the sum from L equals to zero to infinity, uh, AL R to the L plus BL over R to the L plus one times PL of cosine theta. That's sort of our general solution. When we apply the first boundary condition, we're going to have AL times uh, capital RL plus BL over capital RL plus 1. And this is going to be multiplied by PL of cosine theta. And this will be basically a sum over all these different L's here. Sum from 0 to infinity. And that that's going to be equal to kq over capital R, right? So I'm applying this boundary condition here. Um, and then I guess it's times p0 of cosine theta. So um, if I look at all these terms here, I'm going to have an a0 times r to the 0 plus b0 over r to the 1 times p0 of cosine theta plus a1 times r to the 1 plus b1 over r to the 2, etc. Right? So I'll just write my first couple of terms here. I would have a0 r plus b0 over r, I'm sorry, r to the 0, 
part of the one times p zero. Um, I'm gonna just skip the of cosine theta for the moment here, plus um, a one r to the one plus b one over r to the two times p one etc right I'm gonna have all these different terms and that's gonna be equal to kq over r times p0 of cosine theta so by inspection here you can basically see that it looks like um, uh, only the a's only the like the the p0 terms are gonna survive so I'm left basically with this stuff in here should be equal to this stuff here so in other words a0 times r to the z, I'll just write it, r to the zero, I know it's silly to write that, but e plus b naught over r to the one is equal to kq over r. Um, so, so that's true um, for the, well, I guess what I want to say is that the, the, this is something that we'll be able to say about the terms that are next to the p zeros, but you can actually imagine that this is like plus zero times p1, plus zero times p2, you know, plus zero times p3, and so on and so on. So as, as far as just the zero terms go, I can say that this is true, and let's say I wanted to solve for the b0 here. b0 is going to be equal to kq minus a0 times r. So this is something that I can say then about the b0 and the a0 term and how they're related to each other. For the other terms, I can actually say that the other terms are related in the same way that the um, that the uh, um, that we had in example 3.8. So in other words, that's basically saying that all of these terms here, they each have to equal to zero for L equals to one, for L equals to two, and so on. So that means that for A L, R to the L has to be equal to minus B L over R to the L plus one. So in other words, we get the same relationship. So B L is equal to minus A L times R to the two L plus one. This is gonna be true for all the other L's. Like not L is not equal to zero, basically. Okay. So I've got these relationships here. Now I need to actually solve the second boundary condition here, which is that, which is this one right here. So let's let's take a look at the second boundary condition then. Um, the second boundary condition, if we just kind of start from scratch here, we say that V of R uh, uh, and theta is going to be equal to this sum, L equals to zero to infinity, AL R to the L plus BL over R to the L plus one. I know we've already figured out some relationships between these, but let's just, we'll, we'll fill those in in a second, is equal to minus E naught R times P1 of cosine theta um, plus KQ over R times P0 of cosine theta. Oops. So now from this, you can actually see that there's gonna be something related to the, um, to the P zeros. So remember that we're, we're talking about a situation now where um, uh, if the, um, well, let's just write it out here. It says maybe it's easier to see then. If you look at the, um, at the A one term, for example, right? Then you can see this is related to this P one term here. If R is really, really big, this term is going to be really, really small, right? So basically, this is going to become really, really close to zero, right? As far as like, you know, compare in comparison to this R term. So we're basically going to be left with A L, or actually, let's just do A one times R to the one times P one is going to be equal to minus E naught R times P one. So in other words, A one is equal to minus E naught, right? And how did we get this, like, this B term just goes to zero? Well, it's because that this term's not really going to contribute that much compared to this one here. However, for the P0 term, it's going to be the B that really matters. In fact, the A, we're not even interested in looking at this one um, because uh, 
uh, in this it, to, in order to match this term, w this R L even if it was just um, R to the zero here, right? In this case, I guess it's, it wouldn't blow up. But the problem is that there's no constant, right? This it's a one over R sort of dependence. So we're left with a situation where we're like, oh, A zero R to the zero plus B zero over R to the one is equal to KQ over R, right? And these are both, you know, times P zero, right? So this is times P zero, this is times P zero. And so you can see here clearly that like, okay, that must mean that A naught is equal to zero, but it must mean that B naught is equal to KQ. So this is B naught is equal to KQ, and A naught is equal to zero comes out of this situation here. So now we're ready to write down the final answer here. So we have our, um, uh, our, our full solution here, which is that the general solution, just to write it one more time here, is the sum from L equals zero to infinity of AL uh, R to the L plus BL over R to the L plus one times PL of cosine theta. This is our general solution. So let's try for L equals to one, zero. So for L equals to zero, our A zero is zero, but our B zero is KQ. So I'm going to write here 0 plus kq over r to the 0 plus 1, which is r, times p0 of cosine of theta. Now you might know p0 of cosine theta is just 1, but I just want to write it out completely here. Plus, now we have our next situation here, which is, well, this is really the same thing as our other boundary condition here, but maybe we should just, uh, maybe we should just write it anyways. Um, so our other boundary condition here, um, was basically saying that this A1 survives and that all the other, I should write this up here, that, that the A2 and A3 and so on are all zero. And that also means that the B2, B3, and so on are also all zero, right? Because of this situation, because of this, this infinity boundary condition here. So if that's true, then, that, then this really does just boil down to the, the Griffiths example 3.8 solution, which is minus E naught R to the one plus E naught R cubed over R squared P one of cosine theta. So the P one terms survive in that case. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, um, I think that that's all I need to say then, basically. So then in the end, this term right here becomes one, and this term right here becomes the cosine of theta. And so finally, we're left with kq over lowercase r um, plus r minus e naught r um, plus e naught r cubed over r squared times the cosine of theta. And you can rearrange that a little bit if you'd like to, to massage it into exactly the form that he has. But um, anyways, that solution is correct. Um, but I guess I just wanted to sort of, um, yeah, approach it from a different angle or a different point of view and show that it actually leads to the same uh, result. So thanks for watching.